strange coincidence that the three first speakers were all from Berlin. But it says a lot about Berlin, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Hello. Should I just start? Okay. I think you might want it slightly closer. This? Does that work? Good. In the back? That sounds good. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a fairly technical talk, I think. But then again, I try not to go too much into technical detail. So if uh, you guys are not that much interested into all the really low level stuff, just say up. Oh, in general, by the way, if you have any questions about the stuff that I'm presenting, absolutely interrupt me right away. I much prefer having talks where we have a discussion um, between you and me instead of just uh, um, uh, me talking and you listening. So um, yeah, don't wait with the questions to the end. Just interrupt me right away. Um, I'm Lena Padring, I work on SystemD, of course, and um, with this um, talk I kind of want to present to you a little bit about uh, something um, I call immutable and stateless systems with SystemD, which is something we have been working on it towards with SystemD in, in general, slowly but surely. Um, I'm, does SystemD need an introduction? Does everybody here know what SystemD is? Does somebody not know what SystemD is? Okay, I don't take that serious. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, of course, SystemD is a system manager, right? And so it's kind of obvious to do something with systems then uh, next. So yeah, um, so again, uh, what do I actually mean by systems here? Um, I'm an operating systems guy, and that's precisely what I mean. I mean operating systems, I mean systems like little computers, but not just computers, mobile phones, cars, whatever else, everything that runs an operating system, basically. What do I mean by immutable system? Like, um, an immutable system in the, in the context I'm talking about uh, of here is about uh, security. It's about having an OS image that is, uh, cannot be um, modified by an attacker. Um, I mean, we, we live in a, in, a, in a world these days, like in a post-Snowden world, where everybody knows that the NSA and, and, and private hackers and, and who else are capable of, of doing large-scale attacks across the entire internet and, and um, collect um, botnets and whatever with exploited systems. I think in that world, for coming from an operating system perspective, it's kind of my duty in a way to make sure that, that people who use our stuff to build operating systems, to build systems with our operating system, do it in a way um, that makes these kind of things difficult. Um, and yeah, this is where immutable systems come into play. Immutable system basically means that you have a read-only disk image and uh, that's why you boot off every time, and that there is no way to manipulate um, that uh, disk image and still be able to use the device, right? So this is basically the, the way how you can ensure that, that, that the device only runs the original version the vendor supplied, or you supplied, and cannot be modified by somebody else, hack into it, modify it, change it slightly, and turn it into a, a botnet um, member or something like that. Right, so the idea basically is that for, on my laptop, for example, I could make sure that this laptop will only run precisely that operating system version that I put together. And if somebody gets access to my device, which they will eventually, um, sooner or later, like the evil maid, right, like um, when I leave my laptop at, at home or at the hotel or something like that, that I can be sure that when I go back to my laptop, um, at least the software hasn't been manipulated or can't be manipulated, or if it has been manipulated, will refuse to boot. Um, this is not only relevant for me as a hacker and uh, um, my paranoia, it's, it's generally, I think, how computers have to be designed these days, right? Regardless if you build a car or you build a, 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 a light bulb or you build anything, right? Anything out it. Um, it really, or if you build a server, by the way, too, um, if you build anything that is publicly accessible, physically, or so the internet, um, you need to make sure that your disk images are immutable. So, um, yeah, the other thing that in the title of my talk I use is stateless systems. What do I mean by that? Um, by that I mean that uh, a system doesn't actually maintain state, right? Um, what the precise definition of state, in, particularly, in particular in, in comparison to configuration, well, that means, is, isn't entirely clear, but it, it, what, what it's supposed to say is that, uh, yeah, there's nothing stored during runtime on disk, or if it is, um, that there's a nice way to uh, remove it, for example, by power cycling, right? 
So um, a state in the system is basically one where you have the guarantee. Every time you turn it on, it's in exactly the state you expect it to be. Right? So that um, if it only boots up the ex exact version of the software that you wanted to boot up, um, then you know that there's nothing else left over from the previous run. Um, and yeah, I mean, statelessism can mean either that it, that happens on every um, boot up, but it can also mean that it happens only on select boot ups, like for example, if you um, press the factory reset button or something like that. Um, yeah, the last thing in the title was System Beam, and I think you know what that is. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, yeah, I kind of explained the why already a little bit. It's primarily about security. We live in this world where IoT and where servers are universal, and uh, in that world, I think um, this is how devices have to be designed these days, right? I mean, it hasn't sunk in into the minds of the Ambitor developers so far properly, right? Like, because we have all these light bulbs that, that can be used as botnets, and it hasn't sunk in into the general mind of the administrators either because um, uh, data centers are still exploitable on a big scale like this. But I think um, as development progresses, as we get more IoT devices, as we get, get even more servers, um, this is really where, where things have to go to. And it's not just me who has this weird ideas, um, like what we do here with system D is, is just we, we follow what, what others have um, pioneered. Because like, um, if you look at the big, big um, the ecosystem, like you know, with, with Chromebooks and things like that, there, is, there are already, in the hands of, of, of end users, devices that have this kind of protection. What I think, though, like what was my duty as a system guy is um, to make it easy to develop a similar system outside of the immediate Chrome um, um, focus or, or any other focus. Um, also, um, due to the, the Snowden revelations, um, like the big companies like Facebook and Google started developing the, the, the trusted data center, right? And the trusted data center to them means that um, they have huge data centers, right? Like they have huge tons and tons of computers and they cannot really f control that the people who have physical access to them are all trusted, right? Because, I mean, it's too large, it's too many people. So what they do is they, they solve the problem with software and make sure that, that in the Facebook cluster, um, the Facebook operating system is the only thing that can run. And if somebody gets physical access to a server in the, in the Facebook cluster, um, that he will not have the ability to just plug in his own version of the operating system, boot that up and it will boot. Right? So the, the key for them is really the trusted data center so that they know, um, uh, yeah, only the stuff that actually the Facebook engineers um, compiled, put together, is the stuff that will boot, nothing else will. And uh, if people manage to exploit it, um, a simple power cycle will put everything back to, to, to where it was supposed to be. And um, instead of the ability to, to hack something, like the only thing would be a DOS, right? Like, so that you can break stuff by making it uh, not work, but you cannot break stuff by doing it something else that it's supposed to do. So, uh, the primary reason of all of what I'm talking about is security, but it's also robustness. Robustness means um, uh, that, yeah, if you have a device, if you have a server, if you have any kind of system, um, that you can be sure that it only exists in one version, one version precisely, and that the various versions of what you have um, in the wild cannot uh, differ from each other, right? So that uh, they cannot, um, like, that there is no no uncertainty in the way how, for example, updates are are uh, come into play. Like, for example, like many of, of, of uh, the the Amateur devices that are currently in the wild, I guess, use traditional. Linux ways to do package management, like if they use RPM or Depo or something like that. But if you do that, um, you never know um, what you actually end up with, like on the final system, because there might be a reboot at the wrong time, and because um, file systems and, and things like that are generally not, they don't give any guarantees about how exactly the layout things will be on disk. So you always have this problem that, yeah, the longer these machines are in the wild, the further the actual disk image will, will deviate from each other because it all, like, it's up to, to the runtime of the scripts that do the updates and how it ends up with. So, um, by having immutable systems, um, meaning you have one disk image and that's cryptogra cryptograph cryptographically verified and it's exactly the version you have from the window, you get this robustness because you know either it's my version or that it's no version, but it's, it cannot be something I don't have, uh, have under control. Um, something that's pretty closely related to this is atomic updates, right? Like the idea that, that if you have, a, have an appliance in the wild, it should run one version of the operating system or is the next version of the operating system, but never something half upgraded, never something where some of the Debian packages, RPM packages have been upgraded and others have not. Um, 
Yeah, so this is this kind of side effect of what you get here, right? Like because you will cryptographically assign and, and uh, verify um, two specific versions, um, but nothing in between. Um, I already kind of mentioned that this is not only relevant on, on embedded devices or the modern name for embedded figures, IoT. Um, this is also highly relevant servers, right? Trusted, trusted data center, as I already mentioned. So yeah. Um, kind of the point that I have with this talk is really that to make this sink in, right? Like I know that there are, there are, there are people here from from the automotive industry. But regardless, if you build a car or if you build a light bulb or an internet server, this security matters, and this matters all the way down to the operating system. And you should, when you put together your appliance, think about that and uh, figure something out that you make it really, really hard to to. Uh, um, exploit this stuff. Now, security means trusted computing, like at least in this model that I'm trying to follow here. Um, trusted computing, I guess, has a bit of a, a problem. Like, people uh, think probably it's com complicated and it is to a certain level, but it also like it has a bad name, bad reputation in the open source community because um, people misunderstand it as a way how Microsoft can control the ecosystem and, and nobody else can hack their systems anymore. In a way, that's kind of true, probably, um, that it is that. But it also is incredibly powerful because it also enables um, like the people who build systems, like you yourselves and, and, and your company, to, to uh, improve security and make sure that nobody else can manipulate your own devices or the devices yourself. So, um, yeah, the essence really is only run code from the vendor in the version from the vendor in the combination of the vendor. Um, that you have resistance to hacking. Resistance to hacking in this, kind, in this case does not mean that people wouldn't be able to exploit your software. They still will be able to do that because as long as people write software and see and as long as humans write the software, um, it will be vulnerable to hacking in one way or another. But um, the key really is that um, you know that these, these, these modifications that hackers can make are not persistent. That always a power cycle, a reboot, um, can put things back into, to, or a firmware, like a, a, a factory you said, can always put things back exactly into that spot that you want it to be in, where you know that it works. Um, yeah. Again, um, what I'm talking about here is, is in no way new. Right? Like sexy food and, and trusted computing has been around for a while. Like it is in, in every laptop you can buy because Microsoft requires this, even though their platform isn't designed like that in, the, in its entirety. But Microsoft requires UFI secure boot in, in all computers. So basically it means that whatever you buy off the shelves these days allows you to implement such a system where you can enroll your own private um, uh, 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 private keys that make sure that yeah, nobody can manipulate my ThinkPad here, for example. Now, to be honest, I actually didn't do that here on my laptop because it isn't entirely trivial to do. But um, uh, my talk is really about making that easy so that um, in more manageable cases, right, like where you're not so, so much focused on the general purpose but on a specific uh, use case for your stuff, you can make this happen and uh, can build a system that is entirely secure um, in this regard. Um, so, yeah, UFI Specky Boot is pretty universal these days, even though Windows doesn't make use of that. Um, but Chromebooks actually um, pioneered this design originally and made it popular in the PC market. Chromebooks are, have this wonderful um, uh, uh, um, functionality that whatever you do, you know it will always run the Google version of the operating system. And you cannot manipulate it, right? That basically means I can give anyone I know my Chromebook, or even people I do not know, and if I get it back from them, I have a reasonable um, level of, of, of certainty that they were unable to modify the software and cannot um, uh, sneak into what I'm doing there, like taking pictures and, and, and hack into my camera and things like that. Of course, I mean, this is always... Like, everything I'm talking about here is software, of course, right? They can still man hardware man manipulate the hardware and, and add a key log or whatever they want. But I think, as a software guy, it's definitely my duty to make this as hard as possible on the software side. So that's what the talk is really about. So, yeah, commonplace is, like, you can do it on commodity hardware these days, even though it's not generally done. Um, and you can buy it already um, if you buy the right products that do these kind of things in the form of Chromebooks, for example. Um, now, from the Cindy side of things, um, we want to make this easy to deploy in all the other kind of devices because ultimately, I think most of the of the server appliances or IoT appliances probably use a more traditional Linux in one way or another, which does not have these, these functionality out of the box. Like, for example, if I install Debian, 
um, or Fedora or something like that, it will not deliver this out of the box. You have to roll this on your own. With systemd, we try to make this generically um, uh, manageable um, so that you can build your own image, you can build the entire tr trust train, and this is what the talk is really about. Now, in systemd being such a generic piece of, of what a modern operating system and what a Linux operating system is, um, this means that we try to focus on the generic stuff. Now, um, SecuBoot and the concepts around that exist in many implementations, right? Um, UFI SecuBoot is what is common on, on, on PCs, but that doesn't mean that's the only way how to do these things. Like many of the embedded hardware, like ARM systems, generally have a similar mechanism, but it's, it's always specific to those systems. So, and systemly, while we focus a lot on UFI on these things, many of the steps that we did to get that way are actually generically useful even in the other context. Except that, yeah, we mostly care for the generic stuff, not for the specific stuff. So, any questions so far? I hope I'm not speaking too fast. I know that I speak <coughs> fast, but I figure in this audience, the language barrier isn't really there, is, there, is it? Um, no questions. Okay, so the various components that I want to really talk about here, about getting to this goal, that we get to systems that are entirely um, verified at every single step, are the following. Like, first of all, trusted boot. Meaning that the system refused to boot anything that was manipulated, anything that is not the version that the vendor or you originally wanted to boot. The next thing is, after the system is up, you need to make sure that the, that the resources that the system requires during runtime, the files and directories, are in exactly that version also that the vendor wanted to do. So you need, at runtime, verified disk access. Um, another thing is like, uh, that, that is really important is Unix is not traditionally designed to work in that way, right? You can have read-only root disks, but it comes with, with uh, quite a set of problems, in particular, if you want to genetically make it possible that you can have a factory set, then you can boot up with an entirely empty state and configuration, and everything works correctly. Um, the fourth thing that I'm going to talk about here is about building these images in a, in a, in a sensible way, because um, this is actually complex, because if you do all the complexity, you need to be able to, to build kernels, to build disk images um, uh, that have the cryptographic primitives attached um, that make all this possible. The first thing, uh, let's look into trusted booting. Um, my recommendation for that is use something called sdboot. sdboot, yeah, I actually have another slide about that. Later, it's, it's a kind of bootloader shift with systemd. The idea is that you ship that bootloader, you sign your kernels, the kernel images um, are, um, should carry which specific file systems they can boot to, so that you have uh, this basically the first um, link in your chain. Then enroll your own keys in the BIOS. And uh, yeah, the kernel images, uh, of course, should actually just be the kernel images, should be also in it, already use command lines and metadata. And uh, yeah, that's the first step of the thing, the trusted boot. Now let's take a step back. That was a lot of uh, things to digest. Um, so let's have a bit of a talk about what SD boot again is. SD boot is something like uh, many people of you might know it as Gumi boot. It's basically like many think it, many people think it kind of takes over the role that Grub has on most PCs, but it actually doesn't because Grub is a bootloader and SD boot is actually more of a boot menu. It what what it does is just extract. So it looks for kernels on 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 on, on disk and uh, draws a draws a menu and uh, can order them, but it won't actually boot the kernels. It actually tells the firmware to boot them. So it's, it's not an active component, really. It's just a, just a prefix thing. You don't actually need it. Like, like on UFI systems, um, the firmware is actually capable of booting the kernels directly. Um, there's no requirement for any bootloader um, for, for that. There's no requirement to have boot menu or anything like that. Um, you can just boot the kernels directly. SD boot, however, has this benefit that does present users with a friendly menu, but more interestingly, it is capable of uh, um, looking if you have multiple kernel installs, multiple operating system versions, it will be able to sort them by version and then pick the newest one automatically, so that, that if you do upgrades, that you always end up with the newest one um, in the same way. There's a question. Yeah, for the parents, the payload, right? uh, well, it's a UEFI binary. So um, it's it's like yeah I'm, I don't really want to go into to be too much detail about UFI UFI is a complex system it's kind of an operating system of its own that happens to be in the firmware uh, and in UFI you can have executables and executables can be for example 
a driver that can be a game even. You can write games that directly run inside of the firmware without any further operating system involved. Um, but of course, people don't do that. And the kernels are generally um, UFI binaries as well, and so is SD boot. And so everything that happens there is that SD boot starts, and then it starts a kernel um, as the next binary. Um, so SD boot um, is under systemd umbrella, but actually the sources don't really have too much to do with um, systemd. We're actually thinking about splitting out of the repository. We need to figure out what we do with that. Um, it's under systemd umbrella, which is kind of nice because of the, there are certain levels of integration with systemd, but I don't actually want to go too much into detail with that. Let's go back to the earlier um, page here. Um, and the model that I'm, I'm proposing here basically is that you do trusted boot, you sign like in, in, in UFI Secure Boot, what you basically do is you, you upload into the firmware a couple of uh, cryptographic keys, like RSA keys, um, and then uh, these keys um, basically say that anything, any binary, any UFI binary that's executed on that system must be signed with one of those keys. In real life, it's a bit more complex because it actually builds up an entire PKI, but let's just for the sake of simplicity stick to the simple explanation. So uh, what I basically suggest is sign that boot menu, which always picks the newest version of the kernel that you have. Uh, sign your kernels, but make sure that the kernel images actually consist of four things. The kernel itself, the entity, the command line, and the metadata. The metadata just says, like it's a version string and things like that. It doesn't really matter what, what that is in the detail. Um, and the important thing to encode in the kernel images which file system they will boot, meaning um, that you always have the link um, towards one specific version of the file system that you boot. Um, how do you do that, actually? You do it by encoding like it on the command line, on the kernel command line. Um, yeah, I kind of hope that at least most of you came into con touch with the Linux kernel in one way or another and already put together kernel command line. So yeah, I know this is hard to, to grasp here, and I know that many of you will probably not understand everything I put here, but I kind of hope the message that I want to get across is that um, this stuff exists, right? And you can actually deploy it right now. Um, uh, and it's not too hard to do so. Let's talk about the next component on my earlier slide, verified disk access. Uh, my suggestion there is use DM Verity. You, you, DM Verity has nothing to do with systemd or anything. DM Verity is something that was added to the Linux kernel in the co context of the Google people working on Chromebook. It's the same basic storage technology that Chromebooks use. What DM Verity does, it basically, you specify um, a, a, a cryptographic hash, the so-called top-level hash, and um, after you did that, you basically, it, it makes so that everything that is read from a disk has to match that hash in a way or another um, to be permitted through. So um, what it does basically is the online verification that the data stored on disk matches exactly one specific version, and that one specific version is identified by that hash. So, um, yeah, SystemD makes it very easy to use that. Basically, um, in, in, on SystemD systems, um, you can specify on the kernel command line, instead of the traditional root equals, um, some way how you reference a partition that shall be the root file system, you can actually specify root hash. And if you do that, it does two things. First of all, it finds the partition that matches that root hash. But second of all, it also sets up DM Verity, if that's um, available. Um, to to uh, only permit access to that specific one uh, set of data on it that matches that root hash. But let's take a step back again about DM Verity. Uh, so it's a Linux kernel device mapper module. Um, again, I don't want to lose myself too much in details. I think I'm already uh, beyond that, I guess. But still, um, it's a Linux kernel thing, and every single disk access at the moment of the access is very fast. This is opposed to verification at boot or verification at download, right? I mean, if you do, if you do Debian um, system updates or something like that, um, uh, like they all, apt-get or, or DNF or whatever they're called, they all tend to verify, cryptographically verify the packages as they're downloaded before they're installed, right? That's a good thing, but um, it has one problem. It is, um, uh, it is not safe against offline modification, right? If somebody installs Debian, does an upgrade, right, and the, the, the packages are verified at that moment, and then he steps away from the computer and somebody else gets access to the computer, he can uh, modify any byte he wants on the file system, and on the next boot, or, it will never be noticed, 
right? Because there's no further verification. The only verification that took place there in DNF, in, in, in RPM, in, in uh, upget, was at the time the packet was actually installed. Right? There are other ways of doing verification. There's also the, the mode of verification where at boot up you verify that um, the set of files that you want to have your disk are still unmodified. Um, but that is not necessarily, not necessarily efficient, right? Because if you have a large image, that basically means the entire disk needs to be read into memory, verified, and uh, if it doesn't match, it has to, to, to shut down the system. So, um, the Enverity enables you to do this kind of verification, but do it on, on the fly, right? So that every single access is verified at the moment it is done, so you don't have to do anything advanced, and you can be absolutely sure that there's no offline modification possible because you would recognize it because you verify at the moment of the access. Um, any questions so far? Like this was a this second This would one. mean that the system could panic in an hour or something when we access yes. that part of the system that has been modified. So you exactly. Have, yeah. So you basically delay uh, the detection of, of manipulation, yeah. right? But the idea, of course, is like, why would anybody manipulate your stuff if he knows that yeah. You will just break your stuff. You will not be able to manipulate it with you without you know everything. Um, any other questions at this moment? Uh, so every like this block is signed. No, the way well, what it does cryptographically is it builds a so-called Merkle tree, and a Merkle tree is basically a hash tree of, of like a, a tree of hashes, like they built uh, um, on each other, and the topmost hash you specify, but it basically permits that. Every single block has to match the top level hash, but every single block to verify it, you just have to follow the tree. But uh, I don't know. Look it up on Wikipedia. The keyword is Merkle trees. Not like the German Chancellor. Merkel was Merkle, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 it, it's really like a chasm of a file, except that you don't have to go through the entire file to verify it. But you can do that by block. Any other question at this point? Yes. Uh, what the, the performance penalty is? Well, there is a penalty, of course. Uh, but then again, I don't know. I, for my testing, I don't care. And for the Chromebooks, you don't care, right? Like the Chromebooks originally were super slow ARM things and nobody cared. It's like, uh, I mean, also, the, 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 what the kernel does is it caches stuff, right? Like every bit of memory that is in the system today is used as a cache um, if it's not used otherwise, right? So um, after the verification is done, as long as the stuff stays in memory, you don't have to verify again. Also, cryptography isn't really an exotic thing anymore these days, right? Like most of the embedded hardware, even if it's slow, generally comes with some form of, 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 of crypto accelerator. So um, in general, I don't think it's too bad. Of course, if you, if you, if you work on a, on a really slow CPU, then sure, don't do it. But uh, I mean, this is, you have to pay for the security, there's no, no, no doubt. Um, but I think it's, it's worth it in, in today's world. Um, any other question at this point? For example, if uh, one uh, if I design a device and send it to the moon or some places that it's not very simple to reboot it, is it possible to, from the user space, go to the bootloader if there is a fault with the software or can, what they call it, upgrade the software? On well, so, so well, the stuff that I'm doing here doesn't really talk about updates so much, right? Um, that's, I'm, I'm not going to solve the entire equation for you, right? I will solve bits of it. Um, updating is, is something that I think is very interesting, um, and maybe we'll do it eventually, but I'm not going to deliver that to you uh, right there. But of course, um, yeah, atomic updates, like, I think all this stuff is kind of the way how you get to atomic updates, and there are systems like uh, Flatpak OS tree that Alex um, has talked about um, that implement this these days. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's kind of not what I'm talking so much about. I have this explanation. Um, how much time do we actually have? Until five or something? I don't know how strictly they are with five. So if you're done one minute to five, I'm good. Okay. And then we can see how many questions we can make. Okay, let's talk about the third bit, stateless file system setup. Now, um, if you have these immutable file system images, right, like the ones where only one specific image can be booted um, that has been signed by you, or like a couple of them, all the ones that you signed, um, then you have the problem like everything's redundant, right? Unix isn't really designed to be run that way, right? Like you have a slash var, like, like traditionally most of the distributions couldn't run with a read-only root at all. And then 
distribution has got updated, and nowadays they generally can, except that Schleif var generally is assumed um, and required to be writable. So, um, there are different ways how you can do things right away, right? Like, um, for now, I will just focus on three directories actually here, user, etsy, and var. User being always read-only in this mode. But etsy and var sometimes needs to be writable. This can happen in two different ways, either in a persistent or in a volatile way. Like, if it's persistent, it basically means that it's like a traditional file system. You write to it, and next time you boot, it's still the same way. Volatile, however, means that, uh, yeah, the chain, like, every modification you make there, every change you make there, um, only lives as long as the system is up. And as soon as the system is down, it's lost. And the next time you boot it up again, um, it starts fresh. Um, Systemd already has quite a bit of, of uh, groundwork in place for, for, for schemes like that. For example, there's systemd.volatile, which is a kernel command line option. It uh, takes three, way, uh, three uh, uh, possible parameters, like yes, no, and state. If you specify systemd.volatile equals no, you get the traditional Unix behavior. Nothing's volatile, every, everything's persistent. However, if you specify equals yes, you get a fully um, uh, volatile system. And that specifically means that etsy and var are mar mounted as t uh, empty um, uh, temporary directories, like tempfs. Um, so basically, then you boot up with nothing but slash user. Um, so any modification, any change of configuration, any change of state, any where, where configuration means etsy and where state means slash var, is lost as, as soon as it's powered off. And then there's another parameter called systemd.volatile equals state. If you do that, then etsy will be left as it is, uh, which is if you use immutable systems, that means it's redundant. But uh, slash var is still mounted as tempfs. Right? This, is, this makes man probably sense for many embedded environments where it should not be possible to change configuration, but still should be possible to collect logs and other kinds of uh, more, like, less dangerous stuff. Um, then, of course, if you, if you configure stuff like that, there's always Etsy FS tab, right? Like, you can put in Etsy FS tab everything you like, and the system will always support that. So, if you, if you say in Etsy FS tab that slash um, uh, var shall be mounted from a from a persistent disk, then yeah, that of course will work. Um, a little bit of background of that. Um, I kind of already mentioned that. Um, in this scheme, slash user, like slash usr, is considered the unified place for vendor OS resources, always immutable. This definition of slash user isn't really the definition that we always had on Linux, right? For those who have been around for longer in Linux, there, used to, there was a big discussion, um, like in Fedora, for example, like four years ago or something, about uh, unified slash user, and the discussion was basically about making that happen. Um, meaning that um, instead of distributing files from packages all over the file system in slash lib, in slash um, uh, um, bin, in slash sbin, and in slash user, and in a couple of other places, that everything that is read only and comes from the vendor um, should be unified in slash user, Ultimately meaning that, uh, yeah, it becomes a unified place for Windows OS resources and that bin, uh, sbin and lib, like these, these traditional directories that existed in the, in, the, in the root directory, would just be some links to that. So uh, just a little bit of context about what that actually means. Um, but in this scheme, so we have slash user for the unified place for Windows OS resources and etsy is the unified place for configuration. Um, we are less strict on this one. This can be either immutable if you want your system not to be able to change configuration. It can also be volatile or persistent. Volatile meaning, as we already explained. And then slash var is the same thing. Not all, yeah, but, but for state. What, what the difference is between state and configuration isn't always clear, right? Um, like, things like logs probably fall under the big umbrella of state, and things like configuration files, of course, kind of um, uh, uh, belong into Etsy, into configuration. But it's, it's not always clear, this distinction, right? There are a lot of things that, that kind of do not really fit into either or fit into both. What it actually means, of course, is up to you or the packager or the writer of the software. Um, but I think on the extremes, we can define these two things. And it often makes sense to distinguish them. And that's the way Unix did it. Um, of these combinations, I think only these five are really relevant. But you have, like, everything, like, of course, we're talking about immutable systems, so slash user, user will always be read-only. But you can have the version where Etsy is read-only, or you, where you have Etsy is persistent, or where Etsy is volatile, and then a couple of combinations of var. I think always that 
at C probably needs to be more read only than slash var. It probably never makes sense to have configuration uh, uh, um, volatile but uh, state persistent, I think. That's kind of, I, I don't see the point of that. But ignoring that, these are probably the, the, the useful combinations. Oh, well, well, yeah, sure. But, I mean, how, there are other directories, right? Like these ones are the, the three most relevant directories, I think. The, the, the Unix file system hierarchy has quite a number of others. So, Note slash SRV, slash home, uh, slash dev, slash sys, slash proc, slash temp, or something like that. Now, um, I left them out here because I don't think they're that interesting, right? Because they are, like, things like proc, sys, um, and dev, are, they are API, they, they don't actually physically mean anything, they're just the way how Linux likes to name its, its uh, operating system concepts during runtime. Uh, more interesting is probably slash temp, but not even that, it doesn't really matter where slash temp's from, um, it can be memory, it can be on disk, but because it's inherently uh, volatile, um, it's nothing we have to talk about because it can be initialized from zero every boot. More interesting is slash home and slash SRV, um, and I left them out mostly because, I don't know, it's like for, they, they are relevant um, and uh, we have uh, uh, quite a few of um, automatic infrastructure for that in place and the stuff that I'm talking about later. But um, I think like for, 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 for most IoT devices, for most embedded devices, for most uh, server appliances, they probably don't matter too much, right? Slash home is something that's primarily useful on my laptop, right? or on anybody laptop, on a Chromebook kind of thing. And I'm not saying that's irrelevant, but I'm also saying that, yeah, it's a very specific area where that makes sense. And probably you could even argue that slash home just belongs under slash var anyway. But uh, yeah, I mean, in our use cases, home is like a surrogate for the user. Yeah, but users is a Unix concept. I'm, I'm not sure like uh, that it makes like yeah. We can talk about that too. But I mean, the, these slides are supposed to cover only this much, and so yeah. Uh, I want to briefly talk about factory reset, right? Like we have talked a little bit about volatile systems and persistent systems and things like that. Um, you should never forget that that's, that there has to be usually in Amity devices a concept of factory reset. Meaning that if you have a system that is not entirely volatile, you still might want to have a way how you can reset it to the version of the factory, how it came out of the factory. Um, so, yeah, even if you have a persistent Etsy and VAR, there needs to be an easy reset. Now, I briefly talked about this, right? Like, if we have a volatile system with a volatile Etsy, then Etsy is empty during boot. That sounds conceptually easy, but actually making that work on Unix is pretty nasty, right? Um, booting up with an empty VAR is much easier. Why is booting up with Etsy so hard? It's because in Etsy, you have things like Etsy PassWD, right? Which is the user database. Now, the user database is called the user database, so if you don't have local users, you would assume you don't need them. But actually, you do, because it, uh, system users generally generate, uh, like, have a user there. Like, if you run a fucking web server um, on, your, on your system, you usually have its own private user. So if you run, run with an empty Etsy, you don't have users, um, and then your system looks very different than it was supposed to be. Um, in system we, we we try to come up with schemes to make that happen, right? So that um, even if you boot up with an Etsy, uh, empty Etsy and an empty var, that there are ways how you can make sure that if we notice that, um, we will populate it initially with a couple of, of things. I don't want to go into detail already because I don't have that much time anymore um, about the specific functionality. I'm just saying your system temp files is the big thing for that and system sys users will solve this system user thing. It basically allows you to define system users in, as part of slash user, where it probably belongs anyway, um, instead of uh, slash apps for, for system users. That's a question. Uh, so why don't you use an overlay FS for, so you can do volatile Sure, I mean, uh, so the question was regarding why not use overlay FS. Um, that's certainly an option. Like, I mean, it's not a traditionally viable option in Linux, but it certainly is an option today. Um, I think, you know, um, I would much rather do this cleanly and make the Unix hierarchy work with these kind of things. For, to me, the overlay stuff kind of kind of is the cheap way out, right? You ignore the fact that Linux is this complex and you just put something on top um, to make it changes, not hit the disk or things like that. It also has a problem like, I, I, I kind of like this very clear separation that slash user is only read only and that slash Etsy and slash var have the precise semantics that I want them to be, meaning writable and volatile or writable and persistent, right? But if you 
put an overlay file system on top, um, then this kind of gets blurred, right? I don't know. It, it's it's definitely an option, and if you if you need a quick solution to make something like this happen now, it's probably a better option. But then again, um, I think I'm not in this in the, in the like it's not my job to come up with solutions um, that just work now. I think my job is more like like trying to work on the operating system in the long run to make it in the long run clean. And I think the, the much cleaner way is if we just clearly stick to these definitions as Etsy being configuration, var being state, and user being the operating system vendor, and, and make that work, because then we don't need any complexities. Like, I mean, overlay has also not without problems, right? Like, because it really doesn't implement POSIX-like um, uh, environments. And in real life, I think half of the deployments of overlay has probably cr created more problems than they solved with that scheme. But that's another discussion. I thought these systems, the team P files, had their configuration files in etc. They can have that, but generally, um, like uh, if you package them, they you put them in slash user. The temp files basically looks at various places, um, but uh, generally we follow this logic. Like if something is shipped uh, along with the package, it belongs on slash user. If something is is your configuration as an admin, you put them that. Uh, the last thing, which I only have like five minutes to talk about, that I wanted to briefly touch. It's a tool that uh, we have been recently working on under the system here, brother. It's called MKOSI. That stands for Make Operating System Image. Um, it's a tool like many others already exist. Um, it basically allows you to take a distro and build an image from it. Um, the reason why I think it's interesting, and, and I, I don't know, like all the, 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 the web people have so many tools like Vagrant, what they are called, that do kind of the same thing. The relevant bit why this exists is. It's supposed to be legacy free, um, all generic and all auto discovery, meaning, yeah, you can't even generate something with an with an MBR t image from that. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't do any of these this old style stuff. But what it does instead, it's entirely legacy free and it will give you the full trust chain, right? Suppose a variety of distributions can build Debian images, Arc images, Fedora images with it, and file system and a couple of options, but it won't give you every option on the planet, right? Like where it will, it will try to reduce complexity a little bit by trying to focus on keeping things like um, in some ways well defined. Um, like the images are also uh, auto discoverable, um, uh, meaning that uh, that uh, the petition tables explain entirely um, how the system is set up. So that uh, um, if you look at the image, it's entirely sufficient to look at the petition table to know how to mount it and where to mount it, which is not the case traditionally in Linux. And Linux um, usually somehow need to know where the root file system is, and then from the root file system you can read Etsy FS tab and it tells you something about further petitions. But in this scheme, we store everything in the petition table, everything in GPT, because it actually permits doing that. Uh, what it does, what generally the other uh, tools like this don't do, is, is, is do the entire trust chain. So um, if you build an image like this, it will actually generate Verity um, hashes for you. Uh, it will sign the kernel for you and make all the Secuboot stuff relatively manageable for even those people who don't really want to deal with the complexity of Trusted Boot. It doesn't solve it entirely. Like, for example, the complexity of actually generating your own key pair and enrolling that key on your system. I don't care. Like, it's not my job to do that. That's something you have to do. But uh, um, everything beyond that, um, it will do for you. It is also built for developers, meaning like it has these these things like a like a, a two-phase building. So it actually builds the image twice. One image, like the first image, is built with with development headers and these kind of things, so that you can can put that stuff in your uh, development tree, and um, then it will build correctly because all the headers are installed. And then does a second build um, after it generated all the build artifacts, um, but this time it will leave out everything that was necessary for the build time. Um, and then just build you the reduced thing. We use MCO OSI for a couple of different things. We all, one of the main things is we actually use it, or we, that's even why we wrote it, to test systemd itself. Right? If you check out uh, um, systemd from the from systemd build tree, you'll actually find one of those MCO recipe files there um, that basically um, allow you to 
take the current Git version of systemd um, and generate a disk image from it with the actu uh, current version of Debian or with the current version of Fedora with all the dependencies pulled in together so that we can actually properly test systemd uh, for various distributions without heavy, having to do anything manual. Um, MKOSI is written in Python. I, I mean, it's, 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 uh, you could say it's a little more than a uh, fancy way of calling DNF root install. Um, but uh, yeah, the good things, like the, the focus of it is really about making things easy for developers and for people who build appliances um, who just want to have, like, who want to hang their C stuff and then in the end get an get a image out of it that pulls in all the stuff um, properly. Um, yeah. I don't know, I could just briefly touch a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about. I know that much of this is way too complex to grasp this quickly. Um, Oh, what I still wanted to make sure is that you understand, like, this is a toolbox of different things, right? And while maybe the UFI support and SD boot is not relevant to you because you do embedded stuff and only care about the ARM way of doing trusted boot, I believe still a lot of the things that are touched here, for example, temp files and sys uses, whatever else, kind of make sense to you and you can use them in that context. Um, so this is just a toolbox that gets you off the ground. It's nowhere complete. Um, it's not that as complete as I would like it to be, but it never will probably be to, uh, so complete that you can just take it and build your system and you're done, right? Um, this is my last slide about um, the outlook here. Um, and my time's kind of over, but just if it's okay, I'll just briefly yeah, go over keep on going. Um, so, uh, um, there, like the outlook would be that, that this functionality of having entirely trusted um, disk access, right? Like so that that you have payloads that cannot be manipulated with people noticing, is something like well, the first thing is actually not just an outlook that already works. Like um, Nspawn is is a component of systemd that basically allows you to run like little OS containers on top of systemd itself. It's something like Docker, but it's not Docker, and it's more focused on running entire operating systems than just um, microservices. Um, but um, in Nspawn, this functionality, like the, the, the DM Verity support and things like that, is, is and then the, the partition table support, all this auto discovery stuff is all built in, right? So you can actually build an image with MKOSI, and you can boot it on physical media in a trusted environment, like with full verification, but you can also boot it with Nspawn and also get the full verification that, that at the moment that container accesses its own files, you get the verification in the background. Um, then something we are working on uh, for, uh, now is, is, is a concept called portable service. I did a couple of talks about that at other conferences about that. It's something we want to go to. It's, it's kind of our answer to containers because I think containers are weird. Um, and uh, much of this functionality is used in that portable services concept as well. If you are interested in that kind of stuff, um, go to YouTube. I think there might be a talk or two with a video about portable services. Um, uh, something else that I really care about is, is um, what we don't cover right now is all this cover of this SMR, but yeah, let's not talk about that. But the last thing is kind of interesting is um, having the, the complete trust chain for one disk image is usually not enough, right? Like because if you, you will seldom build a embedded device that you never update, right? You always need at least two versions of the operating system um, on each device, like the version that you run and the next version that you're upgrading to, or the version that you run and the last version that you upgraded from. So um, what's kind of necessary still is that we have a scheme where we automatically and robustly can boot um, a, uh, a system so that we try to boot it, try to boot it again if it fails, try to boot it again if it fails, but after three, three times trying that, we revert to the old version. That's, uh, that's something that Chromebooks, for example, implement. It's kind of ne necessity for having really, really quick um, release cycles these days. Because the quicker your release cycles are, the more frequently you update your systems, the fewer, the less time, um, less resources you actually have to, to test your shit, right? Um, and so with Chromebooks and these kind of things, um, the stuff is tested in the wild, right? Like it's, it's a shift to people. But being able to do that means that, yeah, you need to have a recovery if things go wrong and the stuff does not boot up anymore on the, on the systems. So, yeah, I can probably talk about that. Uh, I do talk about just that part. Um, only that part, too. But uh, anyway, this is all I have. Um, unless we're being kicked out, I can take more questions. Yeah. Uh, I propose that I say thank you to some people before we get kicked out. Uh, 
So I'd like to thank uh, Richard and, and John who showed up with very short notice and now the second group. And now I'd like to thank all of you for showing up and all the speakers for showing up and thank you. Yeah, making it possible, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. So now questions, make it run. the execution of the temp FS also. You verify this right. with the root right. FS, but yeah. really want to make sure that someone hasn't put something on temp FS. Yeah. Well, um, so the question was regarding TempFS, if we do any very... Does it still... Did I turn that off? Um, it should actually still work. Um, so the question was regarding TempFS, if we do any verification there. TempFS, by, by its nature, is, is, is volatile, right? Like, you just turn off the computer, and um, when you start again, because RAM doesn't keep the stuff, you start fresh. So um, there is no offline changes possible because right. we always started fresh anyway. So no, we do not don't do um, like the the impl implied assumption is that disk like like CF cards, rotating disk, whatever you have, they are subject to offline modification. But RAM, being um, stuff that is flashed out on each root, um, is not. Is this uh, only Git or is there already a release version? Sorry. If it this already only in Git, or is there a released version of System B? So pretty much everything I talked about um, is actually in a released version in the in the most recent one, um, except for the stuff, of course, that I talked about in the Outlook slide, which well, the first one actually already exists too, but the other ones don't, and we still have to figure all of that out. Um, yeah, but it's still work in progress, right? That's kind of important. Uh, could you have then all? So could you have all the volatile stuff in RAM then, or is that not possible? Well, I mean, how precisely you set up your, your, your individual IoT system is, of course, up to you. Um, the, the thing that we really want to do here is, is come up with a generic way, like how I think it probably makes sense to do. Um, and if you want to make your life easy, then maybe you adopt that, but you really don't have to. Um, if you use this scheme, then slash user, would be an immutable file system, and it can be large, right? Like, depending on what kind of embedded device has, it will be 10 megabytes, but it can be 100 megabytes, or it could be a gigabyte. Um, now, of course, usually RAM is much smaller than that, and embedded devices, but, I mean, ultimately, if you have a small device and lots of RAM, then, yeah, the Linux kernel will eventually cache everything in slash user into, into RAM, and then you run entirely out, out of RAM. But that's, I mean, it's kind of not what I care for, really. That's a kernel question. Right, and, and how you size your RAM against your, your persistent disks. Uh, why is this uh, read-only part uh, in slash user, not at the root of the file system? That's actually a very good question. Um, the thing is, it actually is. So um, what I didn't really uh, uh, put any uh, focus on here is, like this, um, for example, the, the volatile boot time switch that I mentioned there, um, I said there was yes and there was state. So if you select state, what happens actually is that the root file system is um, uh, read-only uh, and is actually a real device, um, and that includes then implicitly slash user, but slash virus mounted from tempfs. But if you do the full volatile stuff, then this means that only slash user is on disk, and the entire root directory, right, including slash etsy, including slash var, but also including anything else you might have there, that's uh, volatile, right? But that's kind of the two modes we support natively in systemd. It doesn't mean that that's a mode you have to run, but um, that's kind of the ones we, we focused on. We didn't really see any particular reason to support a mode where you have slash read only, but then Etsy mounted on tapfs. Like that doesn't like usually there's not much in 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 slash anyway that wasn't supplied by the vendor, right? It's it's I mean some admins do that, but in general there's no real not really a reason to. How is this possible on non UFP systems, such as Libre Boot or Core Boot? Do you boot directly to Grub? Um, well, you know, I, I'm personally not a big fan of Grub. I think Grub is an over engineered, crazy piece of thing, and nobody needs that, right? Like, because actually the the UFI firmware generally make it completely unnecessary to have a bootloader, right? The only reason SD boot exists is not because you want a bootloader. It's it's really just about um, a offering a friendly menu to users, um, who human users, and B 
um, automatically selecting, like discovering a viable kernels and picking one, the first one. Now, when we when we did the the, the SD boot initially, um, uh, we did that at the time where UFI was not the the thing you always got, right? Like where there was still substantially amount of computers that didn't do UFI. Um, and at that point in time, I actually wrote a similar scheme for Grub, like a Grub module, but never got merged. But if you look for it, you'll still find it. It, it was in the Fedora packages, though, though in a very weird way. But uh, um, I don't know. I, I never ran, ran any of the free biases, so I don't really know um, how that works. But if they do implement UFI, um, then SD boot will just work. And there's no reason to use SD boot if they, I mean, they can implement it directly. They, SD boot is one possible implementation, but again, SD boot is a stupid piece of code, right? Like, it just goes through a couple of directories and looks for kernels in there, and, and that's put, how it puts together its menu. That, that, that logic isn't hard, that is, that is, I mean, it's not trivial either, but it's, it's certainly um, not as complex as people generally assume a bootloader has to be, and absolutely not as complex as Grub is. So, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm wondering if you uh, know what Nix and NixOS is, and if so, do you think what you want to achieve overlaps with what they would want to achieve with their project? So the NixOS people actually came to our systemd.conf last year. By the way, you're all invited again. Oh, okay, this time actually will not be called systemd.conf anymore. It will be called uh, All Systems Go, and it will be a little bit broader because the stuff that I'm talking about here, for example, isn't really too closely involved with systemd like the service manager either. It's more about the general ecosystem. But anyway, um, they, the NixOS people were at systemd.conf last year. And uh, I think many of the, the concepts they came up with are, are awesome. But um, uh, much like with Atomic, like the Red Hat Atomic thing, which is OS tree, there's one major difference of this scheme um, to this scheme. And that is, this scheme with DM Variety is kind of focused on having strictly mutable stuff, meaning that the file system itself is being protected, right? So that file system, like the, the people cannot corrupt the file system because that will also be recognized. This is different from systems like OS tree or NixOS or things like that because they generally assume, like they, they live one level above. They assume that the file system is trusted and it's okay, um, but uh, then on the file system, they when they drop stuff there, then they do the verification and use hashes and whatever else to, to, to match things up correctly. But uh, I think, it ultimately doesn't deliver the same level of trust because it doesn't protect in any way to offline modifications, right? Um, it's like, uh, yeah, this this thing I think is way more secure, and I think I personally think, even though I know that people disagree, um, this is the way to go. Um, but uh, I mean, ultimately, I think in the in the broader ecosystem, Linux ecosystem, people don't agree at all that cryptography at this level and only having embedded devices that are always strictly verified is actually the way to go. I personally think it's absolutely necessary, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's really where you put your stuff. You build entirely untrusted systems, build more trusted systems like OS3 and, 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 and NixOS, where you do verification at the install phase or update phase, but not any uh, offline protection, or the, the entirely trusted stuff where you actually are safe against um, uh, offline stuff. And I'm, I'm very much sure we should go the whole, the whole way because otherwise it's probably not worth the exercise. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm still interested in um, a secure solution that where you have deduplication between the A and B image. You didn't mention OS3 for, I think, for certain reasons, but, and I think you might be working on something else. But do you have a comment on, on that, where we don't have to keep two images that are almost identical? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you asked the questions probably because you remember what we talked about at FOSTEM, right? I, I do remember <laughs> some of it, but I'm so, also surprised we didn't mention at least it's a temporary step to use OS3 for it or something. Well, I mean, I think, I mean, OS3 is great, but I also think it doesn't ultimately deliver the, the things that I think we have to deliver these days, like being the, the entire stack of security there. Um, 
But uh, so, so yeah, the, the reason like like what we talked about at Foston was a, a tool that I'm working on. It's called CI Sync, and I haven't really made it public yet. Even though a number of people um, I did introduce to it, uh, introduce it to to them um, personally. Um, CI Sync is a tool that basically it's a it's a yeah I can probably do an entire talk about just that. It's um, it's something like of between uh, Git and between rsync and probably even between OS3. And the, 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 the thing that it tries to do is that if you build images like this, like if you build systems like this, you, you of course um, have regular updates and you have updates over and over and again. And this scheme kind of suggests that you always keep two complete copies of them, right? And that you download two complete copies, right? And every time you update, you would update the entire um, uh, image again. This, of course, is problematic. Right? OS3 um, solves this much better because they only download the individual files that have changed. And uh, other, like Nix OS, same thing. Um, the, the CI thing that, I was, uh, that I'm working on, right, like actually at the moment, um, works differently. It, it uh, um, tries to, like it basically, it takes a serialization of everything, chunks it up into blocks, but these blocks are, like for those of you who know the rsync algorithm, it uses that. Um, they basically the, the, the blocks uh, are the same if they contain the same data, um, like in, in respect to size and, and hashes and everything. So we serialize everything, we chunk it up into blocks, and then these blocks are individually downloaded. And uh, you have the benefit that if you do an upgrade, you can first use what you already have as a seed, and then you only have to download the chunks that you're missing. Which um, the way it's written. Um, like the focus is on being able to reuse as much as possible. Meaning, like I mean, if you do uh, have a quick release cycles, you generally, most of your, your tree stays exactly the same, right? Like, for example, the time zone stuff will probably never change, right? Like you, you have, it's a large file, it will always be the same because time zones don't change. Okay, they do, but not very often. So um, uh, the idea really is about recognizing these, these similarities and not downloading that over and over again. Um, that's called CA Sync. It's on GitHub, and it's, you will see that that's kind of where most of my commits go these days. Um, I, I didn't make it public yet, right? I didn't write a blog story about that um, because I want to cover a couple of more things. But it will solve some of these things, right? Ultimately, I care about compatibility with GPT, and GPT does not permit, of course, that you have uh, uh, partitions that overlap, right? Like this concept doesn't exist in GPT. Um, so what I, what I want to be able to is that at least we don't have to always download the same shit over and over again. So that even though you have two disks, uh, two copies on disk locally, um, you will not always download them all the time over and over again. But yeah, that's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's kind of fits, like CSync fits into this entire scheme because it solves the, like the next thing, like the update stuff. But uh, it's not finished, right? It's a work in progress and that's why I don't talk about that publicly, yes, on, except to some select people, but yeah, I mean it's it's not secret either, right? Like um, if you want to know more about that, just ask me. And um, I figure I Alex wants to leave the mic the last time. <laughs> so I know you love L, yeah, but couldn't you have a layer between the invert the inverity that like reconstructs the so, box into a full image so that you can always store it once? Um, yeah, we could. Like, like actually, like you know, as a block device, yeah, that's exactly what a CI sync can do for you. So with a CI sync, it actually but on the kernel level. No, it uses because then you can only store it once. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that. We could, like, we should talk about that in person anyway. But um, yeah, I thought about precisely doing that one of those days, maybe. But um, uh, what it already supports, if you look into it, it can actually take any. Uh, like set of chunks that you have stored somewhere on the internet and make them available as a local block device, right? So um, then you can actually mount it like like any way you want, um, and that's that's kind of what you want. Except that of course you want to have it one step further, and that instead of using like a, a queues, uh, no, um, like a NBD fake block device, you probably want the kernel to do that internally and it's part of device map or something like that. And people can certainly do. It. But let's talk about that in, in person. But uh, Anyway, I'm sorry for so much. No, no. But I, uh, thank you very much for all the questions. I very much appreciate if I get this much question because it kind of makes me feel that some people at least understood a bit of what I was talking about here. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
So I had a single slide saying see you next year, but I'm just going to save. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Well. That was really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful for like audience that actually gives good questions. That's always the best thing. You know, I've been in, in a conferences like in India or something where you just finish a talk and nobody else appreciates it. I mean, these people what are Swedish. Like, you have to give them half an hour to soften up, and then they have questions. I didn't, I didn't understand fully this about the root file system. But where does, where does the slash directory fit in this scheme? So I mean, in the letter, the, the, like in the like the tumor, like if you do the the, the, the full state of stuff, then slash would be tempfs. Okay. Oh, okay. And then uh, you would slash mouse slash user from the real file system, right? And then whatever you else need in slash is created a group. Like slash proc is created a group. Yeah. And this is all selected by the system. The, 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 the yeah. The